Hello again, fellow YouTubers and fellow Bond fans. Solomon Pleasant back for another James Bond movie review, which I haven't done in a couple of days, so I felt I feel like doing one now. And today we are looking at Timothy Dalton's first appearance as Bond in The Living Daylights. Now, The Living Daylights is one of the two films that I had a hard time remembering and I had to rewatch. The other one being For Your Eyes Only. So let's just say this one was more fun to watch than For Your Eyes Only. Having that said, said though, this film is a bit forgettable for me, which is why I had to rewatch it. Because most of the other Bond films I've only watched like once, maybe twice, but I still remember them way better than this one, so. Let's keep that in mind as we dive right into The Living Daylights. So we're going to start off with story, and that's the main problem with this movie. The story is hard to follow, and unless you follow it really well, you're going to need to watch this film again, because you cannot go through it the first time unless you follow it really well. If you don't, You'll have almost no idea what's going on, and for me, it was kind of boring, so for that reason it was hard to follow, thus I didn't remember it. Second time around, it's basically this. Our two villains, um, mainly General Gorgle is the main villain here, and he's basically trying to kill off most of the British spies. And he's basically just trying to kill them off. It seems simple when you think about it, but the way they go about it, it's like hard to follow. I'm just like, whoa, wait, what's going on? Oh, whoa, what was that for? Um, uh, oh, oh, uh, it, uh, it, it's just hard to follow. It really is. It almost makes no sense when you really look at it. There's some cocaine involved, I think. Some explosive stuff. Yeah, hard to follow. Very hard to follow. And that's the main problem with the story. It's hard to follow. When you think about it, they're just trying to kill off a bunch of spies. Not that hard when you really think about it. You could have gone with this a different way, but they didn't. So, for that reason, I give Story a half a star because it's hard to follow and it's just way too complex for what it needs to be. We on the scenery. I really like the scenery in this movie. There's some points where they're in Russia. That looks really nice. There's a car chase that looks really cool when they're doing that in Russia. Um, the scenes where they're at um, one of the other villains, Brad Whitaker's um, mansion or whatever. The mansion looks pretty nice, actually. Um, there's a place where some of the Ally 6 people are staying at, that manor, I think it is. It, it, it looks nice. Um, when they're in the desert of that one country that I can't remember the name of at the moment, if you'd like to tell me what it is, tell me in the description. Um, that desert area looks really nice. Everything looks really well good. The scenery was well put together, I think. I kind of wish they would have taken some of the effort that they put into the scenery and put that into the story to make it, like, less complicated. But they didn't. But beggars can't be choosers. So, I give scenery a star because scenery does really well. It, it's a really good scenery. When we got to follow up, it doesn't follow, this film doesn't follow up Roger Moore's, um, A View to a Kill. It doesn't. A View to a Kill is way more memorable because of the villains. Yeah, so it's mainly, um, characters that make it so that this film doesn't follow up. I can take a story that doesn't make as much sense if you have good characters, but the characters just don't work in this film, so the follow up doesn't go all the way through. This could, this film could easily follow up, um, View to a Kill, because View to a Kill left some points in there where it could follow it up, and it just doesn't, and I think that mainly has to do with characters. Story, I can kind of let slip by, because story is one of those things where you can have it be worse than the last one, but still have really good characters to make it a good follow-up. Like, um... I'm trying to think of an example. Hmm. Crap. Where's a, where's a good example? Where's a good example? Uh. Yeah. <laughs> can't. I can't. 
I can't. Ah, there we go. Best example I've got is um, Diamonds Are Forever and Live and Let Die. Diamonds Are Forever had a better story, Live and Let Die still followed up because everything else was pretty good about that. So there's that example. Anyway, so for follow-up, it just doesn't do it. It almost gets there, but it just doesn't because the story is complicated. And that's not the major problem. Major problem is characters. I will explain characters with later. So, uh, you follow up a half a star. Moving on to theme song. I like the theme song for The Living Daylights. It's just a really good theme. Aha, uh -huh, I believe this is the name of the group that this. They did a pretty good job, and I genuinely like this theme. It's it's in my top 10 area, it's not my top 5, but it's in my top 10. So it did a good enough job where I can like it enough where I'd listen to it again and be like, yeah, I kinda like this song. So for that reason, I get theme song a star because it did a pretty good job. Finally, characters. Timothy Dalton did as good of a job as Roger Moore did. He filled Roger Moore's shoes for the time being. And I think he's he's basically filler. He did an okay job filling before Pierce Bronson came in. He did a good enough job. He didn't do a terrible job. I mean, it's not... His acting isn't bad. I mean, he did an okay job as Bond. And it doesn't show as much in this film as it does in the other one, which we'll talk about next time, but... And this one, Timothy Dalton just does an okay job, and I, I think he didn't... I think he does an okay job as a Bond. Bond girl. Um, name was... Eh. Karina, I think. I, I find her to almost totally useless for the most part. She does almost absolutely nothing in the film, really. I mean, at the beginning, she's trying to assassinate someone, which gives you a motivation, but then I don't really see any more real references to that. She's apparently being hunted now, and... Really, she's just extra weight in someone for Bond to bang later. She's another one of those Bond girls where it's like, do you really need her Bond? I don't think so. I don't think you really... I honestly don't think she's really necessary there. Again, if you can contradict me, um, description. Because I like hearing other people's thoughts. For the few of you that watch these things. Anyway, um... Chew Branch and MI6 in total, they do an okay job. You see them enough where it's like, oh yeah, you did an okay job. Um, this film really has a lot of allies for Bond, which I, all of them do an okay job. There's uh, Sanders and he gets killed, which is kind of a shame, but he did an okay job as it was. Um, Pushkin was an ally, he did, he did an okay job, job too, I liked him. And then there's, um, I'm just going to call them desert people, no offense, They're, I just... I'm calling them that. Um, people who help Bond get out of the desert. They also do a nice job and they're good allies. Um, while we're on that desert scene, that plane fight, which I'll talk about in a few seconds, is actually a pretty good fight scene. Anyway, moving on to villains. Henchmen. Nicarus is a pretty good henchman, actually, and I think he's a very underrated henchman. Because he, he's just pretty cool throughout the film. And he does die by falling off the plane in a fight with Bond. He just kind of grabs on a Bond's shoe and Bond just tears all the laces off and he falls off the plane because of that. And it's like, oh, what happened to him? Gave him the boot. Yeah, that was, that was pretty good, actually. So, um, Nick Rush was a pretty good henchman. As for villains, Brad Whitaker and General Gorgel, um, no. They just aren't that good villains. There is nothing memorable about them. There's almost nothing memorable. It's just like, oh, there's nothing that I can remember you guys by. You are boring. You have no distinct features. Part of a villain, and the way I remember a villain, is by distinct features or a certain way that they talk or a certain way that they act. That's how I can remember them. Like, uh... Blofeld. Distinct features, distinct way of acting, Distinct relation towards Bond, that makes him memorable. Goldfinger, distinct way of acting, that's what makes him memorable. Um, heck, the Spectre agents, they're memorable looks they either have features that are distinct, or a way they act is distinct. These guys just are just bland. It's like, oh, there's nothing for me to really look at or listen to that sounds interesting enough for me to care. 
And that kind of brings the film down, because again, if you would have made the villains better, or or given the Bond girls some reasoning for being there, really, I think that would have brought this film up really well, and it would have been a good follow-up, and thus the and if the characters would have been good, the follow-up would have been good, and this would have been a much different review in the way this would have gone. As it is, there's just a... Most of it's average or below, so for that reason, I gave characters a half a star, because there's just not enough memorable performances here where I can remember something. Half star. So, this gives Live and Let... Ah, The Living Daylights an 8.5, which is something I've given to stuff like Thunderball, I think I've given it to... Uh, the Moon Ranker and The Spy Love Me, so it's not like this is the first time. And it's not the worst. I at least somewhat enjoyed watching it the second time around when I kind of was paying attention a little bit more. If you pay attention, at least a little bit, you and you kind of know what's going on, it's a little more enjoyable than some of the other Bond films, like For Your Eyes Only. Yeah, so this isn't one of the worst. It's certainly not one of the best. It's, it's somewhere in the middle. And again, Timothy Dalton does an okay job. And while we're on it, the opening scene where we first see him is actually a pretty good opening scene. And that training camp, at spy training camp thing is actually a pretty good scene. But again, 8.5. So, that's all I've got. This has been Salt and Pleasant. And next time, what's next time? Wow, that is a world record. Next time, our last film with Timothy Dalton. You didn't stay here very long. <laughs> Still, this should be interesting. Anyway, so, this has been Solomon Pleasant, signing off.